Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Duncan Trussell Family Hour. This is Duncan Trussell, and I'm glad you're letting my raspy lesbian voice vibrate your electronic equipment in a way that it causes your neurons to fire and translate my squawking into something that makes some moderate sense. Now, let's play a fun game. Hi, this is Duncan Trussell, host of Fun Questions, and the question this week is, which of these three murderers is this man talking about? He's not a drug-crazed, uh, wild man running around with a machine gun. He's not a person that is driven by perverse uh, sexual desires. He doesn't drink. He doesn't gamble. Uh, all of these things... Um, which many persons that are involved in killing and murders uh, often are motivated by, uh, is nothing more than a predator uh, on human beings. Uh, his motivation is greed, and his method of murder is very varied. Is it A, President Barack Obama? Obviously, a lot of these strikes have been in the, the Fatah uh, and going after al-Qaeda suspects who uh, are up in very tough terrain along the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, for us to be able to get them in another way uh, would involve probably a lot more uh, intrusive military actions than the one that we're already engaging in. Or B, presidential candidate Mitt Romney. I can assure you if I'm president, the Iranians will have no question but that I would be willing to take military action if necessary to prevent them from becoming a nuclear threat to the world. Or was he talking about C, mafia hitman Richard Kuklinski? You could uh, put it in liquid form. You could, uh, there could, person could say, for instance, a person could be in a bar. You bunk into them, possibly uh, by mistake, or say you were intoxicated, spill a drink on them, and leave. Meanwhile, it's soaking through their clothes into their pores and into their system. That is a tough one, and we'll have the answer next week. The Duncan Trussell Family Hour is sponsored by Shore Design T-Shirts, which is an incredible T-shirt company located in Thailand that uses the tears of unicorns in the production of their amazingly soft shirts. Go check them out at shoredesigntshirts.com. If you put my name in, you will get 10% off of any of their awesome shirts. We're also sponsored by Audible. You can go to audibletrial.com forward slash family hour, and you will get a free audio book if you sign up for a trial membership, which means that you can um, cancel at any time and have a delicious, wonderful audio book sitting in your iPod for you to listen to the next time you end up on a boring drive or making love with someone that you don't really like. You can pop in your audiobook and try to forget about the whole thing as it's happening. The Duncan Trussell Family Hour is located online at duncantrussell.com. Go check out all the other incredible episodes of this podcast that are there and join the forum. You can share your recipes with us, sex secrets, magical rituals, or any other thing that you want to talk about. It's a very open-minded community, and I would love for you to join. Thank you to everyone who has donated to the Duncan Trussell Family Hour, and thank you for everyone, everyone for buying t-shirts and posters from the shop. But more than anything, thank you so much for continuing to listen to this podcast. I love you guys very much, and I'm super excited about today's guest. He is an author. He's written over 14 books. He wrote the amazing book, Fingerprints of the Gods. He most recently wrote Entangled. He's a world explorer. He scuba dives off the coast of Japan and takes pictures of ancient underwater cities. He drinks ayahuasca with shamans in the Amazon, and it's a great honor to have him here on the Duncan Trussell Family Hour. So everybody, please welcome the amazing Graham Hancock, who recorded this from the UK, which means we use Skype, so sorry for any weirdness in the sound quality. So now please send out your psychic tendrils to embrace the pineal gland of one of the coolest people on earth, the amazing Graham Hancock. It's the Duncan 
Thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Uh, you are a hero to me and to uh, most of the listeners. I tweeted it last night. I don't know if you saw the response, but everyone's freaking out that you're giving, uh, giving me this uh, interview. So thanks so much. I'm really pleased to, to be with you, Duncan. I enjoyed, I enjoyed meeting you last year, and it's great to talk again. And this might be an, an esoteric way to start off, but I, I don't know if you heard about these new uh, crystals that they found that they can encode information into, and the crystals are almost indestructible. Have you heard about this? No, I haven't, I haven't heard about that. Not, not crystals. I've heard about encoding information on DNA in fantastic quantities, which is very interesting. But the crystal story I missed. If you only had a little bit of information to encode in those crystals to explain to people down the line what we were, how could you, with your vast understanding of history, how... How can you summarize what's happening to us right now? How would you summarize, and forgive me for asking you to summarize the entire history of civilization, <laughs> but how would you explain? I would, say, I would say we were a people who lost our way. We became, we became overcommitted to technology and... Uh, Overconvinced that material reality is the only level of reality, we severed our connection with uh, spirit. We ceased to respect the planet, this beautiful garden of a planet that the universe has given us, and uh, we paid the price. What's that price? Well, I think the uh, uh, if if you're if you're talking about a, a time capsule for your future, I think that I, I think that our civilization as it stands today will not endure. I don't think that uh, I, I don't believe in a in a coming apocalypse. I don't think that the universe is going to turn around and slap us about the head. Uh, but I think that we're making so many mistakes as a civilization um, with the with the model that depends on the big state, the big corporations, the big centralized religions, all of these things mobilizing enormous funds and manipulating fear and hatred and suspicion in order to make themselves important these are dividing us uh, one from another, uh, leading us uh, down the wrong path and, and, and leading us ultimately to, to self-destruct. Humanity will go on. Uh, our story will continue. Maybe things will even get a lot better, but the, the present system of society that we have created uh, cannot endure the model is broken it isn't going to go on working and i think uh, everybody can see that the uh it seems like th what you just described is not unnatural but it seems to be a part of the cycle of human society yeah i i think so and that's you know that's my as a matter of fact that's my take on the mayan calendar um, I don't think that, uh, I, I'd, I'd like to repeat this, I mean, I am not, you know, uh, one of those people who are saying that the end of the world is nigh. I don't believe that the end of the world is nigh. But I think uh, anybody with a rational mind uh, can see that the model of society and civilization that we've created has reached breaking point, uh, and that uh, it cannot it cannot continue for very much longer in this way. I mean, governments can go on uh, printing money and doing quantitative easing, as they call it, for for a while to postpone to postpone the problems. But this this notion of endless production and endless consumption just isn't working anymore. And and it has separated us from the realm of spirit, so that we've been conned into believing that we are just purely material creatures with material needs and wants and that there is no transcendental purpose or, or meaning to our lives. And unless we, you know, unless we rapidly reintegrate uh, spirits into our lives, uh, then I don't think that we're ever going to, to, to fix the problem that the world has, the world has come to. 
the um, a lot of the a, a lot of the stuff that you have brought out into the world is very controversial and um, and involves the sort of the symbol structures that have been used by power for a very long time. For example, on the dollar bill, on our currency, on the basis um, of uh, uh, the basis of our mode of transaction in this modern age, it's covered with Egyptian symbology. Yes, curiously it is. Can you explain why that is? No, I can't. I, I, actually, I actually don't know why that is, um, particularly since ancient Egyptian civilization and ancient Egyptian society was, um, in many ways, uh, one of the most beautiful and harmonious systems of social organization that's ever been manifested by mankind. I mean, you have to remember that ancient Egypt uh, survived as a culture for 3,000 years. Actually, probably a bit more than that. Uh, it was only really, it, it wasn't even the Greeks and their occupation of Egypt with the Ptolemaic dynasty, second or third century before Christ, that wrecked ancient Egypt. It was the Romans, really, and the Christians. It was the toxic combination of Roman state power and... Uh, Christian hypocrisy and ego, uh, which destroyed uh, ancient Egypt. But for 3,000 years before that, uh, the ancient Egyptians had been amongst the, the happiest, the most fulfilled, uh, the most content uh, people on earth, um, and uh, lived a life that was, that was both d deeply spiritual and uh, materially enriching as well. They they really had found a, a balance, a, a, a place of balance for mankind on the earth in the universe. Um, so it seems it seems odd to me that those that the symbolism of ancient Egypt should be should be hijacked by malicious and negative powers. Uh, but that's you know that's often the way that uh, that that things things work. I mean I I I, I take this view. Uh, of uh, religion, of the three mainstream religions of, of, of Christianity, uh, Judaism, and uh, Islam. They tell us uh, that the entity uh, we are worshipping through them, and it's the same entity whether you're a Jew or a Christian or a, or a Muslim, they just give him different names. They tell us, tell us that this entity is God and that he's good and that he does... Uh, you know, he has the interest of mankind at heart. That's the talk they talk, but the walk they walk is a walk of of cruelty and and violence and control. Down the ages, these these three religions have been responsible for an enormous quantum of human misery. Uh, whether we talk of the the burnings at the stake, I mean, you know, can you imagine what is involved in burning a fellow human being at the stake? The Christian Church used to do that routinely for hundreds and hundreds of years, or in stoning a fellow human being to death uh, because the, their ideas disagree with yours, as, as, as Muslims do today. And, and uh, you know, somehow what is actually clearly the behavior of a, a demonic force uh, has hijacked the notion of God and persuaded us that that, is, that that is what it is. So I do think that dark forces are at work in the world and that they hijack positive symbols and use them for their own purposes uh, to attempt to harness the power uh, in those symbols. And perhaps that's what's happening with the, the use of ancient Egyptian symbols in undoubtedly at the heart of the power complex in the world today. Do you believe that uh, uh, symbols, symbols are imbued with power projected on them by human beings or that they have within them an innate transcendent power i think that the uh, the pyramid uh, as a as a structure and the great pyramid of giza in particular and therefore images images of it also uh, does have uh, an an innate transcendent power um, the first time that I stood in front of the Great Pyramid of Giza, uh, I was utterly captivated by it. Uh, it seemed to reach out to me and embrace me and require of me 
uh, an effort of will, that this was something so extraordinary, so remarkable, so awe-inspiring, that it, it was essential that I should learn about it. It forced me to learn about it. And I'm not alone in that. Millions all around the world have been drawn towards the Great Pyramid, have indeed stood in front of the Great Pyramid and have had questions sparked in their mind by it. And those questions do lead to a, to a process of uh, self-initiation uh, eventually as you, go, as you go along that road. If you start, if you start asking yourself fundamental questions about this, this thing, why this shape, why these dimensions, you start finding that interesting answers spill out. Well, goodness, this thing is actually a scale model of, our, of, of a hemisphere of our planet that the, if you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by 43,200, you get the polar radius of the Earth. And if you take the equatorial, uh, if you take the, uh, the, the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid and measure it accurately and multiply by the same number, 43,200, you get the equatorial circumference of the Earth. So somebody right there is telling us um, about our planet, the, 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 and, and, and you wouldn't immediately grasp that from looking at it. It doesn't look like a hemisphere, it's a, it's a pyramid, but it actually incorporates the same dimensions on a scale of 1 to 43,000. It sits on latitude 30, you know, exactly one third of the way uh, between the equator and the North Pole. Um, it's, astonishingly, it's an astonishingly accurate uh, device weighing 6 million tons with a footprint of 13 acres, perfectly aligned to true north, south, east, and west. As you start getting drawn into this, you find that you're teaching yourself all kinds of stuff that you didn't know before. You're teaching yourself mathematics. You're teaching yourself astronomy. Um, you're you're uh, learning about our planet itself. Uh, and I don't think any of this is, is accidental. I think that monument was very carefully designed to evoke these questions. And although it once stood within... Uh, an immensely ancient system of knowledge which supported it and reinforced its message. And although that system of knowledge has largely been stripped away, the Great Pyramid continues to work its magic upon us uh, and to force us to question fundamental assumptions about our lives. That, that um, it, I think what you're saying is it kind of operates not just on a, uh, the, uh, the level of geometry uh, or on the, on the level of um, geography, but it, if it has those, those aspects encoded within it, what would you say are the deeper level messages that the pyramid teaches people? The pyramid is fundamentally, in my view, um, concerned with the mystery of life and death. Uh, it's concerned with what are we really here to do? Uh, why are we? Why is our consciousness incarnated in these in these human bodies? What lessons are we here uh, to learn? Uh, th those seem to me to be the deeper messages of the of the pyramid. If you're lucky enough to find yourself alone inside the Great Pyramid, uh, as as I have done on a number of occasions, if you're lucky enough to be alone inside the King's Chamber. Uh, a kind of heavy stillness descends upon you, and uh, and you discover that that uh, you're entering, you're slipping into into an altered state of consciousness, uh, and 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 whole areas of of reality and thought that may have been closed off to you begin to become uh, accessible. There's no doubt in my mind that the ancient uh, the ancient Egyptians used the Great Pyramid as a consciousness altering uh, device. And they used it to explore uh, the mystery of reality. Thus, when the ancient Egyptians talk about life after death, uh, as they do all the time in their amazing sacred texts, from the pyramid texts through the coffin texts, the ancient Egyptian book of the dead, the book of what is in the Duat, they are not simply spouting off a religious mumbo-jumbo. They are sharing with us the result uh, of centuries, of millennia, of direct exploration of the meaning and mystery of life. And, uh, and, and they come to, to, to very specific conclusions. And the, the Great Pyramid is part of that project to find out 
what we're here for. Now, the one reason that people speculate that these symbols are all over our dollar bill is because, well, they don't even speculate. It's because the Masons were part of the American Revolution. And yes. the Masons are, uh, you know, deeply into, the, into sacred geometry because they believe that geometry is like the... I, I, a Mason explained this to me. Geometry is the first language of God or something. It's mm -hmm. the, and so they're, very, they're deeply, deeply into this stuff. And the, to the point... Some of them are. A lot of Masons are just in it for the beer, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yes, for sure. I believe that, yes. And, and, and I know that it, it, it probably functions on, on many different levels, but... I think it does. I think it always has. And it seems like so many things are like that, that function on many different levels. And this is what I'm really curious about, because there's um, one side of me which has the tendency to look out into the world and see the power structures that are happening and see what basically amounts to a kind of global vampirism in the form of the military industrial complex transforming human life, transforming human life into money mm -hmm. that's one of the most horrific alchemies that i've they maybe has ever existed in the world at the level that it currently has even though the alchemy's always been there in the form of slavery or anything that uses a human's existence uh to benefit someone else in a parasitic way um, yeah it so it's it's to me i i, I and this is something i've been thinking lately maybe these symbols on money or maybe these symbols in washington dc the uh washington monument and the encoded masonic symbols in the very street patterns of dc maybe those are placed there by people who aren't malevolent Maybe there's this idea of hiding from the masses or hiding from the, the uh, tidal forces of society because they realize that by being in front of these tidal forces, you always get plowed over. I don't think that they're malevolent. Um, I, I think the malevolence is exactly where you've pinpointed it in the military industrial complex, in the big bureaucracies, in the the huge, uh, hugely powerful and influential mainstream religions, which just shut down the thought of millions, billions of people all around the world. Uh, they, they, you know, we take in we take in uh, the teachings about these three monotheistic faiths in childhood. And, and unfortunately, in the case of billions of people all around the world, these teachings are never again questioned. They just act in a knee jerk way like puppets being driven by these malicious and malevolent religions. So if I, I think if we're looking for for the presence of evil in the world today be much more effective to look at it in the mainstream churches, in Christianity, in Judaism and Islam than it would be to go off hunting for, you know, some kind of Masonic uh, conspiracy. As a matter of fact, uh, if you go back into the history of the, uh, the Freemasons uh, and trace them back through the Knights Templar, uh, who themselves were exterminated and burnt at the stake, by the Catholic Church, mm. uh, I have no doubt in my mind that Freemasonry is uh, uh, is a survival uh, of of what the Knights Templar were were aiming to do, and what the Knights Templar were aiming to do was fundamentally to undermine the power of the Church, to work within it, to undermine it. There's all kinds of curious things. You talk about Washington D.C. Uh, look at what look at what happens right there in front of the Vatican uh, in Rome where you have uh, put up by, by Bernini in the 1600s an Egyptian obelisk standing in front of St. Peter's Basilica. And that Egyptian obelisk is surrounded by a circle divided into eight parts. And uh, the obelisk has on its uh, tip uh, a cross. Uh, now, people think a cross on an obelisk, this is you know, just a, one of the symbols of Christianity. But somehow what Bernini knew uh, when he put that up, that what he had created there in three dimensions, right in front of the heartland of the power of the Roman Catholic Church, was the three-dimensional ancient Egyptian hieroglyph for Heliopolis, because that is the hieroglyph for Heliopolis, an obelisk surmounted by a cross standing upon a circle divided into eight parts, and nobody could read the hieroglyphs 
in the 1600s. Uh, so as a secret message, uh, teaching uh, the, the ancient Egyptian system of religion has been planted right in the heart of the Vatican. It's like a, it's like a huge secret slap in the face to the power of Roman Catholic Rome, which is just standing there uh, waiting to be figured out. And again and again, I think these symbols have in fact been used in a subversive way uh, to to bring down these these hateful and dominant power structures. Yeah, uh, that's and, that's and, right. and 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 you know that is why that is why the church hates Freemasons. As a matter of fact, you know we're, there's a there's a whole culture in the world today of of suspicion and paranoia about about Freemasons. But when I look at their history and what they come out of, and the story of the Knights Templar, the story of the Cathars in the south of France. The, again, the horrendous persecution that they were subjected to yes. uh, by the by the Roman Catholic Church, the secret societies that have emerged from that. You know, if you're existing in a power structure that will burn you at the stake if you disagree with it, it's quite a good idea to be secretive. Yes, that's it. And 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 so that's I find that very interesting because I think that some people have applied this kind of malevolence to these secret societies when I think really it's more of a cleverness where they've recognized the brute aspect of power can't be reasoned with and must be subverted from within and in the shadows. It seems like the yeah. only way to do it, which gives me some hope in the world because yeah, I, it gives, I, I, it gives I, me some hope as well. I think that's, uh, I, th I think that's how it, how it works. And I think the heritage of Freemasonry is an honorable one. I'm not a Freemason myself, I've never been asked to be a Freemason, and you do have you, to be asked if you're them. going to join. Um, I, have, I have met Freemasons from time to time. I occasionally give lectures to Freemasons. I find them to be open-minded and, and, and thoughtful people and, and to, to exist at, at, at many levels. Many of them truly are in it as a, as a kind of men's drinking club. Um, but but and and just having a good time together. But others are are definitely in it. Those at the speculative end of masonry are often into deep uh, spiritual inquiry about the nature of the universe and the nature of our lives uh, here here on this planet. And I don't see them as malevolent people. I realize that may not gel with quite a number of your listeners, but I just don't see them that way. I agree with you 100. percent I don't see them that way either. My grandfather was a mason. I he's the nicest guy ever. <laughs> There's nothing yeah. malevolent about my grandfather, but. I, I only bring it up because I'm interested in, uh, right now, my mind keeps going to this idea that um, what you're talking about uh, in Egypt, this uh, attainment of a, of a technology, which any system of governance or any, um, any way that a society is run where it can create such uh, uh, powerful symbols like the pyramid... Uh, that's that's an advanced technology. And yeah, but I mean, what a, what a, in a way, let's speculate, what a brilliant act of subversion to get your subversive symbol printed on every single dollar bill. Well, I, I exactly. You know, I, I, those dollar bills are out there in circulation, passing through millions of hands, and every one of those hands, if they glance at it, they're going to see that symbol. It may be it may be working in a positive way on their minds. Well, that that's I mean, I when you look out at the world, when you see someone like. Romney, or when you see some of the people who... What an idiot that man is. What a complete and utter idiot. I mean, I, it's something about him is so spooky. He reminds me of somebody like in downstairs in a Vegas casino directly after snapping a prostitute's neck and trying to play it cool. Like, yeah, <laughs> very sinister, very sinister. I mean, I have to say this is true of the political class the world over. Uh, I mean, really, there, there either, I'm not inspired by any politicians. I'm not inspired by Obama either. I'm not inspired by the useless idiots that run my own country, Britain, you know, completely shallow and empty men with no, with no character, no principles. All they're interested in is power and money. I think this is true of the political class the world over. There is, there is hardly a single decent and honorable politician in the world today. So, so no wonder they're, they're leading us to hell uh, at a fast pace. Yes, that's it. I mean, well, they're, they're, um, it's, a, it's a very curious uh, it, it's very, it's a very curious time in human history because I think people are more than ever really realizing that the, the entire system appears to be some form of uh, 
pro wrestling or some kind of gaudy theatrics that people are buying less and less and less. But there is a growing disgust with the venal and corrupt political class that rule the world. And I take a lot of hope in that growing disgust. I, I talked about the Mayan calendar earlier. And the Mayan, one of the very interesting things about the Mayan calendar, it doesn't forecast the end of the world. It doesn't forecast apocalypse. It doesn't forecast doom. What it forecasts is the end of a particular cycle of the human story and the beginning of a new cycle. And it so happens the Mayan calendar has been running for 5,100 years, the Mayan calendar that, that reaches the end of a cycle on the 21st of December 2012 has been running for 5,100 years, and those are precisely the 5,100 years of the big state, the big corporations, the big hierarchical controlling dominator religions. And uh, uh, amazingly, the Maya seem to have at least got that right that we are coming to the end of that cycle of the human story. And all over the world, in, partly, in part it's due to the Internet, people are waking up, young people in particular. They're refusing to accept that bullshit any longer that's been stuffed down our throats by the, 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 the controlling uh, dominator culture that we live in. People are just not buying into it anymore. And we see through clearly the, the shallowness and the lies and the folly of our political class, and there's a worldwide disgust uh, with the with existing power elites, and that ultimately will translate uh, into change and into a new form of society where the individual is uh, is 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 sovereign, and and our right to make decisions about our own consciousness and about how we should live without having to 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 take everything off the peg from some pre-established model. A new innovative era of human consciousness is on the way, I believe. And that's, I want to talk to you about that. Um, you mentioned that w the great problem right now is that we've lost our way because we've lost our connection with a kind of transcendent intelligence. And a, yeah. a lot of people have a variety of names for that intelligence. Um, and it, so I want, to, I want to ask you, how does an individual translate the awareness that the power structures have become antiquated and are no longer serving any purpose other than destruction, how do you, what actions can a person take to bring us closer to the, past the transition, to bring us into whatever this next thing is that we all feel is brewing? I think, I think we all need to spend more time in altered states of consciousness not uh, in the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness that is favored by our society today. That, that state of consciousness has its uses, but it isn't uh, the only state of consciousness of which we are capable of human beings. It is, in fact, just a tiny percentage of what we're capable of. Uh, and it's not an accident that the dominator culture that we live in today uh, persecutes uh, altered states of consciousness, persecutes people who use psychedelics to explore altered states of consciousness. Um, and of course, psychedelics are not the only uh, tool or technology for gaining access to altered states of consciousness. It happens that uh, shamanic uh, cultures around the world, tribal and hunter-gatherer cultures, um, whose main mode of contact with the realm of spirit is through shamanism, uh, have perfected a large number of technologies for entering the necessary trance states, the necessary altered states of consciousness. Um, in a large number of cases, those do involve the use of visionary plants, such as ayahuasca, of which the active ingredient is uh, DMT, or such as psilocybin mushrooms. But uh, in, in other cases, it involves rhythmic dancing, uh, fasting, uh, meditation, uh, sensory deprivation, there's all kinds of ways to step aside from the alert problem-solving mode of consciousness and to embrace the other states of consciousness of which we are capable and to learn the lessons that are taught to us in those states of consciousness. And I think that this is, um, this is one of the great battles that's underway in the world today. There's, our society is waging a war on consciousness. Uh, it is bombarding us with... Um, 
in, incredibly, unbelievably meaningless messages 24 hours a day through television. You know, just watch, watch the rolling news on television, the constant messages of hatred and fear and suspicion that are generated there. You know, watch, watch reality TV shows um, pr- consume that our sole purpose on this planet is simply to, to consume and to consume more than our, and more ostentatiously than, than, than our neighbors do. There's just an, an enormous bath of, of, you know, completely useless and meaningless messages are constantly being uh, constantly being poured over our, our consciousness by by our society. The notion of patriotism, another another one of those horrible knee jerk ideas. Why on earth should I feel more loyal to somebody else just because they happen to be born on the same piece of land than me? I don't mm. care what piece of land they're born on. I don't care what color their skin is or in which cult- culture they were brought up in. All I care about is the ideas those people have. Patriotism tells us that we must specially favor other people who were born on the same piece of land as us and leads again to division and hatred and fear and suspicion in the world. The mainstream religions tell us that if we don't follow the, 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 if we don't follow their point of view, then we're blasphemers, we're evil. You know, all of this is so negative and wicked and wrong, and it's all tied in to a very narrow band of human consciousness. And the way to break the chains of that is to embrace altered states of consciousness, I to agree. sit at the feet of the shamans in tribal and hunter-gatherer societies and learn what they have to teach us. Uh, it's part of the um, uh, abuse of our society today that, that people do use psychedelics for recreational purposes. Psychedelics should not be used for recreational purposes. Psychedelic, psychedelics are sacred tools for the, for the investigation of consciousness, for the exploration of consciousness. They should be used with reverence. They should be used with respect. They should be used with proper control of the space in which the use takes place. All of this our society has completely forgotten about. And as, as a result, uh, you know, we, we have, we have a, 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 a situation today where we simply don't know how to use these, these powerful vehicles for transformation. Well, that's, a, that's something I'd like to ask you about, because I don't, I don't think, a, I'm sure some of the people who listen have the ability to find a shaman, to make a trip to South America, to go through an ayahuasca ceremony, but not everyone does. But I think a lot of, most of the people who probably listen to this podcast can definitely get their hands on some mushrooms or yeah. some form of psychedelic. So how would you advise someone who has never taken mushrooms ceremonially or, a, or any psychedelic ceremonially? What's something someone can do? Uh, what would be the perfect trip for them or a way for them to get... Well, first of, first of all... Uh, f- first of all, be sure that somebody in the circle is already very experienced with using mushrooms. Right. There must be somebody there who is very familiar with the effects of, uh, of, of the mushrooms. Um, secondly, create a ceremonial setting. Don't just, you know, hang out, but make it a ceremony. Make it a, make it a special time. Show reverence to the plant which in many ancient cultures is regarded as a teacher, as, as an ancient teacher of mankind. Go, go in with the intention of, of reverencing those plants and, and learning what they have to teach us, not for some recreational interlude, but with the hope of some deeper understanding of, of the mystery of why we, are, why we are here. Make a ceremony, make a circle. Before, the, before the, 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 the group begins the experience, share your intentions, speak to one another. Say, what do you intend from this night's journey? What do you hope to gain from it? Do it calmly, quietly, with reverence and respect. Take the mushrooms, pass the journey, and the next day share your experiences, again with reverence and respect. That's a way to start. And like I say, make sure there's somebody there who knows what they're doing. Right. right. Yeah, I, you know, I, that, this is one of the, uh, to me, something that's really upsetting on YouTube is these videos of idiots smoking um, salvia. You know, mm. and, and they're doing it, you know, you see like, they're, you hear video games going on in the background or MTV and they're smoking this really powerful shamanic plant yeah. and then punching each other in the arm. During, during I think, I, yeah, I agree with you, Duncan. I think that's a huge mistake. And, and I, I just, I just think, I just would, would wish that people would not do that. 
these 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 visionary plants are extraordinarily powerful agents of transformation they do have lessons to teach us and because they are teachers they deserve to be treated with respect with reverence with ceremony uh and and we should do everything possible to shut out the intrusions of the dominator culture in which we live and which includes computer games yeah, well, yeah, I mean, God, what a talk about the new heroin. That's an undiagnosed heroin is what that is. People don't realize the narcotic effect of these of video games. They will eventually realize. Yeah. I mean, what's, I mean, aside from the fact that with heroin, you're blasting your body with a foreign chemical, the, physically, when you're playing video games and nodding off on heroin, it's really quite similar. You're just in a... I, I would say I would say it's quite similar, and and also the 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 narcotic effect of 24-hour television. You know, many people can't sit in a room without having the television switched on. Um, but you know, to get back to the idea of this ceremony, this is um, this is something that I've been thinking about lately. I've been reading some. Um, for the past, I don't know, eight months or so, I've been reading a bit of Crowley and studying some uh, different forms of ceremony and ritual. And, you know, you, it doesn't seem, especially if you believe that certain symbols are imbued with, with their own power, they have within them some innate power in the same way that certain elements have radioactive qualities. It seems like they're are certain ceremonies that would be more effective than others. And instead of just making something up, is there some something you could recommend for people who would want to follow something a little bit more formal when entering into a psychedelic state? Well, I think I, I think I've just recommended it really. Um, I, the, the, I, I, I speak most directly from experience with, uh, with ayahuasca and uh, the way that we, the way that we drink uh, ayahuasca uh, is is first of all w one amongst us is uh, is enormously experienced with ayahuasca. He will uh, drink the ayahuasca with us, but he's also quite capable of of helping those who get into difficulty. And you do get into difficulty uh, with powerful psychedelics from time to time. Um, it can be a, a terrifying experience. Often it's not, but, but sometimes it can be. The utterly alien realms into which you enter and the, 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 the powerful intelligences that you encounter in those realms and the direct confrontations with the truth about oneself uh, can be very disturbing. So, so it's very good that there should be somebody there um, who is uh, is enormously experienced with these uh, with, with these troubling effects and can help to bring calm and peace and, and and closure to the individual who is who is troubled. It's very it's very good to do to 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 do psychedelics in a group setting uh, where I, I wouldn't say a large group, but anywhere from from five to a dozen people would be I would say the ideal number. Um, and and uh, actually, with psilocybin, it's quite nice to be in nature uh, and to take to go with your group and 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 walk into trees and, and forests and 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 just appreciate nature and listen to nature and hear the wind through the trees and see the light sparkling off the leaves and off the waters and and uh, have a, have a make a reverence for nature part of it. But with ayahuasca. Uh, typically, you're not, you're not actually in quite a fit state to go walking. Uh, ayahuasca tends to make you a little bit ill uh, physically, uh, and what you prefer to do is to is to lie down in a darkened room uh, and think very carefully about the music that you have playing in the background, because the music helps to guide the the journey um, and and to and to set the mood of the journey. Uh, as I said, gather together before at the beginning of the ceremony and speak aloud your intentions for the journey, what you hope to achieve from it, what you're bringing to it, what lessons you hope to learn. You may not learn those lessons. You may learn other lessons, but it's a good idea to express your intent to be there for one another uh, during the night of the journey, to help one another uh, through difficult times and the following day with reverence, with respect, to share your experiences with one another. That would be my, you know, my outline of, uh, of the way to handle uh, a, a, a ceremonial journey with psychedelics. 
great. Yeah, that's that's def. I think that's probably the opposite of the way that I did psychedelics when I was in high school. The way we would do a psychedelic ceremony is go to like a, a the deepest redneck drug dealer uh, that we got all our psychedelics from, and then go back to somebody's trailer and watch Pink Floyd and then wrestle with each other completely. <laughs> completely yeah, you know, the, no, 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 rever- no reverence there at all. No, no, because no one, no one taught us that. No one, no one, no one taught us because our society doesn't teach us. Instead, our society teaches us to hear, to hate, and fear. Uh, these visionary substances uh, and creates an atmosphere of paranoia and dread around them uh, when when in fact they can be uh, enormously enormously nurturing I'd urge anybody to go read Aldous Huxley's amazing novel Island uh, which is much less well known than his other drug novel Brave New World Uh, but Island is a beautiful beautiful novel about um, a society that makes uh, a, a powerful psychedelic mushroom experience a fundamental rite of passage uh, at the age of roughly 18. Uh, this, um, yeah, Huxley. By the way, that's another point I would wish to make is um, these, uh, these powerful visionary substances are not for children. Uh, this is uh, this is something that that uh, really should be should be kept until maturity is reached. Yes, yeah, I, you know, I I agree with you though. My experience with it was <clears throat> when I was a kid, but I sure, think, I, think... I, I know that, that I know that that's the case, and that's inevitable in a society that has a war on drugs, where one cannot talk rationally and respectfully about these substances. But in a society that's open and that embraces the power of these substances, we can explain to young people, this is not the time now. You're, you're, you're too young to really appreciate and learn from this experience. Be patient. Wait a little bit. Wait a few more years until you're ready, and you're going to get so much more from it. And then when they know that it's not something that's permanently banned and it doesn't have that allure of the illegal, uh, but that it's something that's regarded as an important life-transforming experience that's worth waiting for, uh, perhaps they would wait for it. Would you, um, do you think you could share uh, what a ayahuasca trip is like, what it feels like, what, what kind of things you see uh, during the trip? I've, I've never taken the drug, but I'm fascinated. Yes. Um, I've, I've drunk ayahuasca rather more than 40 times now. Wow. Um, and, uh, by the way, it's not the case that on every ayahuasca session you have amazing visionary experiences. Uh, it's possible to drink ayahuasca and not have visionary experiences. One shouldn't be disappointed by that. The plant is doing other work with you when that happens. Um, but, uh, typically there are two, there are two distinct elements to the experience, quite apart from the physical elements, which include, uh, waves of uh, vomiting, uh, nausea, and diarrhea. Uh, you know, you really do have to brace yourself. This is quite a tough physical trip. Um, it's called the purge in the Amazon. Uh, and it's called that because it does have strong purgative effects. But the shamans in the Amazon regard the purging uh, as, a, as a fundamental part of the ayahuasca experience, that in a sense you're cleansing your body of toxins and you're cleansing your spirit of toxins. Uh, at the same time uh, while this happens. Um, A fundamental aspect of the experience is what I call the life review, where you're confronted by a true picture of your own behavior towards others. Uh, This is why people often burst into tears during ayahuasca sessions, because you suddenly realize that you're not such a nice guy as you thought you were, and that you've actually been toxic and damaging and hurtful to others. Ayahuasca shows you that mercilessly, it shows you the pain that your words and your actions have caused to others from their point of view, not from yours. It's so difficult for us to put ourselves into other people's shoes. Ayahuasca obliges us to do that. And that can be very painful uh, because that, you suddenly, I, you, I, you could, suddenly realize that, that uh, you, in a way, are putting your own immortal destiny in jeopardy by the cruel words that you have spoken to others down the years and and these come back to you to haunt you but it's painful but it's a vital teaching because it gives you the opportunity to change that behavior in the future to become more nurturing more loving more consciously 
careful about the feelings and needs of others than you've been before. Ayahuasca is a tremendous teacher in that respect. And secondly, there's the powerful visionary elements of ayahuasca, the contact with <coughs> with um, intelligent entities. In the Amazon, uh, ayahuasca is often seen as a female spirit, um, and it's well known that she presents herself in the form of a serpent, uh, a gigantic anaconda-type serpent, uh, sometimes as uh, another creature of the jungle, a jaguar. Uh, and sometimes as a human woman, and I've met Mother Ayahuasca in in all of these uh, all of these forms. Um, it's very common to see what are called therianthropes, creature that, creatures that are part animal and part human in form, and that and that communicate with you uh, telepathically. All of them have lessons uh, to teach you. And I've I've recently been been sharing because I think it's time to share this, and I'll share it with you and your listeners now. Uh, something very extraordinary that has happened to me uh, as a result of the five ayahuasca sessions I did in Brazil last year. You know, Duncan, when I met you and Joe, uh, and we did Joe's podcast at the end of last September, I believe it was, um, I was about to get on a plane and fly to Brazil. I don't know if I told you that you at did. the time. Yes, you and did. I was going down to Brazil to have five ayahuasca sessions. Now, Prior to that trip, um, I had been smoking cannabis uh, for 24 years. Uh, I, st I was 61 then. I'm 62 now. I started smoking cannabis quite late. I was 37 years old when I started. Um, and initially, it was a relatively small part of my life. But as the years went by, it became a larger and larger part of my life. When I wrote The Sign and the Seal, I only smoked cannabis of an evening after I'd finished writing. It was a kind of have a pipe and get a little drowsy and go to sleep. But when I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, I was smoking cannabis from morning to night. Um, uh, let's say 14 hours a day, seven days a week, every week of the year. Wow. And this carried on. Um, uh, I switched eventually uh, to vaporizer technology. Uh, one of the one of the things that I, you know I would urge anybody working with cannabis is try to get hold of a vaporizer because because um, it's much more it's much more helpful for your lungs than the combustion products in smoke. And again, if we lived in a rational society that really cared about the health uh, of of our citizens, uh, we would make the benefits of vaporizer technology much more available. It's just much healthier. So I, last five years or so, I was, I was using a, a, a vaporizer uh, and smoking steam rather than smoke. Um, but I, at certain point, I transitioned from somebody for whom cannabis was a useful ally and a friend uh, that helped me, a plant ally, that helped me with the creative process and with my writing, I transitioned into somebody who was abusing cannabis. And I think that really the moment I started using cannabis uh, seven days a week and, and 14 or 16 hours a day, I became that person who was serving cannabis rather than being served by it. And uh, in the la latter years, many friends and, and particularly my, my beloved partner, Santha, noticed changes in my behavior that I became increasingly distrusting, uh, that I became paranoid, uh, that I became uh, very easily a a angry in certain, certain circumstances, ir irrationally so. And, and this was driven by paranoia and mistrust. And I refused to accept that cannabis was in any way implicated in this. I believed that, that uh, cannabis was a fundamental aspect of my life, that I would never be able to write my books without cannabis. So when I met you and Joe, Last September, um, I was uh, at the at the end of a, a, a of a 24 year non-stop uh, cannabis habit, and I wow. didn't know I was at the end of it. I had no idea that I was at the end of it until I went down to Brazil, and I had five ayahuasca sessions. And in those five ayahuasca sessions, I was shown it with the most graphic and merciless clarity how awful I had become, how terribly I was treating my partner, the cruel words that I was saying, the suspicion and paranoia that I was manifesting all the time. And I was shown that I was poised on the edge of an abyss and that if I continued to smoke cannabis, uh, I would go over the edge of that abyss into, into total insanity. 
and that I would uh, and that I would become a very harmful and toxic person. It scared the shit out of me. I've never had ayahuasca sessions so powerful as these. They turned my life completely upside down. And during these sessions, I began to voice the intent. I didn't believe that I would be able to give up cannabis. I never believed that. I, it was so much a central part of my life. And, and, and I'm not one of those people who gets really dreamy with cannabis. When I smoke cannabis, I'm actually quite focused and together. I can, I, I can write, uh, and I, do, I did write extensively with cannabis. Um, and I, I just felt it was a central part of my life, and I would never give it up, and I wouldn't be able to write books without it. Uh, but I did say during the ayahuasca sessions, uh, when we had the sharing the next day, I did say I've been shown visions of myself and I've realized I have to change my relationship with cannabis. Well, when I came back to England in October of 2011, after a long flight, the first thing I did was get my vaporizer out and fire up a big bowl of cannabis. Yes. And uh, I filled the bag and I had first puff on the bag and I was filled with a feeling of horror and self-loathing and I persisted I took a second puff on the bag and I suddenly I suddenly just had this most terrible awful feeling and I realized that I could not I physically could not continue to smoke cannabis ayahuasca had actually taken the matter out of my hands I was not going to smoke cannabis anymore and I expelled the 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 vapor from the bag closed it up over the next few days I got rid of my stash and I have never since that day, a full year has passed now, I've never touched cannabis again. I haven't, I haven't ever smoked it again. And this, this to me is like a, a miracle. It's a miracle that's happened to me. Now, I don't want to put cannabis down. I recognize that it's an amazing plant ally, that it has amazing healing power, that it's incredibly helpful for many, many people, and it was incredibly helpful for me at one point in my life. But I had stepped over that line from responsible use into abuse of cannabis, and I needed to stop. I'd come to a point in my life where I absolutely needed to stop doing that, and ayahuasca did that for me. I was put through the mill in those five sessions of ayahuasca. I was shown the truth about myself, and when I came back and the old habit reemerged and I tried to smoke cannabis again, I physically could not do it. I feel, I feel like a new man. I feel... I feel a huge monkey has been taken off my back and far from my writing uh, being diminished by the absence of cannabis, I'm far more productive and, and, and far more uh, eloquent and effective as a writer today than I was a year ago. So it, it sounds like what ayahuasca does is it removes your ability to be in denial in a very yes. intense way. Perfectly put, perfectly put. That's exactly what ayahuasca does. It strips away all the illusions and leaves you with the truth. And that is why people compare it to death, because so much of who many of us are is just illusion and denial. Yes, a construct, a construct that we present to the world, how we want the world to see us. Ayahuasca shows us how we really are. Now, I'm listening to you, and obviously the only thing I'm thinking is, I've got to try ayahuasca. And yes. I'm certain that many people listening now are contemplating how do we have this experience because it sounds so important, um, so evolutionary, so uh, life-changing that it seems like it, it's the most important thing that anyone could do. How do we do yep. it? How does someone do it listening? Is there a, a safe way that they can find a shaman? Is there... Well, I, w I would say, first of all, f f first of all, if it's, a, if it's at all possible, and I realize it's not possible for many, uh, travel to Peru or travel to Brazil. Uh, in both countries, ayahuasca is legal. It's responsibly administered. You're, it's easy to find people who know what they're doing with it. Iquitos in Peru um, is a place where, where uh, good ayahuasca ceremonies are available. Do your research very carefully check it out check it out on the internet try get some word of mouth try get some recommendations of of uh, of good shamans if you're not able to go to peru or brazil uh many uh, responsible nurturing well thought i thought out ayahuasca ceremonies are available in the united states again you're going to have to find your way to the plant 
uh, you're going to have to make the journey. You're going to have to do the research. Don't expect it to just fall in your lap. Uh, but start asking, start asking questions, start putting out feelers, and you'll find that somebody in your circle does know somebody who knows somebody who has worked with ayahuasca. And that way you can connect to the network. It is a bit of an underground network because in many states, uh, ayahuasca is, um, is completely illegal, a Schedule One drug, as a matter of fact. Interestingly, in America, one of the things I love about America is your constitution. And uh, in the Constitution, and also the spirit of independence that exists in America, even today, even in these dark times, uh, just as America is, um, is the source of many of the problems in the world, so also I believe America uh, is the hope for the solution of many of the problems in the world. And that has a lot to do with the spirit of independence that continues to thrive in America, uh, where individual communities choose to go their own way, and people think freely and resent the state imposing itself upon them. And one of the good things is that, that uh, in Brazil, uh, we have um, a couple of what are called ayahuasca churches. One is called the Uniao de Vegetal, the UDV, and the other is called the Santo Deme. They um, uh, mix uh, ayahuasca use, in the case of the Santo Deme, with a certain form of Christianity. In the case of the UDV, it's more with a, a philosophical approach to the universe. Um, they uh, are recognized and established, quote-unquote, churches. And in a number of states in the United States, it started in New Mexico, uh, court actions have been fought. It's gone all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has agreed that members of the Unia de Vegetal or of the Santo Deme may drink ayahuasca uh, legally as part of their religious uh, belief. Uh, it's, a, it's guaranteed under the rights of religious freedom, rather in the way that the Native American church uh, allows the use of peyote uh, for Native Americans, even though it's illegal for all others. In this way, ayahuasca is available in a number of states in the U.S. I believe Oregon has recently joined the list. Um, New Mexico, certainly. Uh, check out the Santo Deme and the Unia de Vegetal. They are enormously experienced in using ayahuasca, and they're not a bad place to start the ayahuasca journey. Um, I personally uh, don't particularly enjoy the slightly hierarchical, uh, organized, highly organized aspect of the UDV and of the Santo Deme. I've got nothing against it, but I don't. It just doesn't particularly work for me. I'd rather work with a with a shaman in more traditional um, setting. Uh, of, of working with and using ayahuasca, but the UDV and the Santo Deme are certainly a good place to start. And otherwise, just put feelers out, put the word around, find out who knows about ayahuasca ceremonies in your area. Many shamans from uh, Peru and Brazil are coming north. They are visiting America. Again, it's all underground. Ceremonies are taking place in, in private homes led by shamans very safely, with with care, with reverence, with respect, and with some risk uh, of attack by the forces of the law. So this is all done underground. It's like being a member of a Gnostic sect in the third century. It all has to be done by word of mouth. But if you're, if you're determined enough, you will find your way to the right shaman, to the right facilitator, and to the right ceremony. Beautiful. Um, great. That's great. Great information. Um, I, it, it's it's uh, almost been an hour, but I, I want to talk to you about your new book before we wrap things up, because you have this uh, new book, which I have not read yet, but I read the description of it, and it sounds awesome. It's called Entangled, right? Yes. Um, I'm known as a writer of nonfiction. Uh, all of my big books uh, were, were nonfiction investigations of historical mysteries. Fingerprints of the Gods is the, probably the best known of my yeah. nonfiction books. Uh, but as part of my work with uh, with ayahuasca, I got I got signaled very strongly that I that I should write some fiction, uh, that I should write uh, a, a novel. Um, and 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 not only as part of my work with ayahuasca, but also as part of my own personal development. I I um, I got a, I got to a point where I became fed up with having to deal with academic critics. My, my, my nonfiction work has been very controversial, suggesting the possibility of a lost civilization. And this brought me um, just a huge number of attacks from mainstream academics, historians, archaeologists, all determined to discredit me. 
And uh, because students were approaching them in class and saying, what about this guy Hancock? He says there was a lost civilization. And they found that very annoying. Um, and, and so what I found was that as the years went by, because I had to take account of these critics, rightly and properly, my writing became more and more defensive and my books became longer and longer. So that the book I wrote about um, underwater ruins submerged by rising sea level at the end of the last ice age, that book is called Underworld. That's you know close to 900 pages long wow. and has something like 2,000 footnotes. Uh, and frankly, it's a pretty heavy read in the way that Fingerprints of the Gods was not. When I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, I was coming from a place of freedom. But uh, all of the, the criticisms and the attacks kind of chained me down and made me more and more of a defensive writer attempting to bulletproof every argument. And it suddenly occurred to me that I could continue to explore extraordinary ideas, but do so within the vehicle of fast-moving adventure fiction. And uh, I wouldn't have to deal with any of that critical apparatus at all. Right. Uh, because, hey, you know, it's just fantasy. <laughs> so I ended up writing my first novel, which is called uh, Entangled, and it's, uh, it's about the battle of good against evil. It's a time travel novel. It has uh, a young woman called Rhea 24,000 years ago in the Stone Age. And it has another young woman, Leone, uh, in 21st century Los Angeles. And they're brought together by a, a benign supernatural being who they call the Blue Angel uh, to do battle with a demon who travels through time and who is seeking to mislead and misdirect and ultimately to destroy mankind. And what the novel suggests is that time itself is an illusion and that many different epochs intersect and interconnect, that time is not an arrow, not a straight line moving from past to present to future, uh, but that past, present and future all coexist in a sort of tangled cat's cradle of spirals and cycles of time and it's this mechanism through the use of altered states of consciousness that enables my two heroines one in the 21st century one 24,000 years ago to encounter one another and the, the modern heroine uses uh, DMT uh, in its pure for form and uses uh, ayahuasca as vehicles to uh, travel out of body uh, into the past and the ancient heroine Rhea uses psilocybin mushrooms for that for that same that same purpose and it is um, I have been criticized because there is a, there is a tremendous amount of violence in the book uh, and I think many many new age thinkers uh, feel that uh, you, you know that somehow everything is good and the world is the universe is just wonderful and there's no evil or violence in it but that's not been my experience and I, I'm writing a novel about the battle of good against evil and I felt I needed to show evil as it really is and as it manifests and that that is what my heroines are confronting in others and indeed in themselves and seeking to overcome in themselves um, I've, I've had a tremendous amount of criticism for the for the violence in the book that were, as the, from people who seem to believe that we should just pretend that such things do not exist, that we just have to wish goodness and goodness will come. But uh, really what I'm describing is a sort of Stone Age Hitler in the form of this demonic uh, entity. And, uh, you know, Hitler was a case where where really he had to be stopped on the battlefield. He couldn't just be wished away with um, positive thoughts. Graham, are you uh, at, a, aware? at a certain point, evil becomes so powerful that there's only one way to stop it, and that's to take up arms and deal with it. And that's what the heroines in my story do. Uh, Graham, um, and Entangled is volume one of a two-volume series, and the second volume is under preparation. Um, I, I wanted to, based on what you just said, by the way, that book sounds like you wrote it for me. I love you. I cannot wait to read that book. It sounds so Well, awesome. I'd love to hear what you think of it when you have. I can't wait. Now, but I wanted to bring, some, bring something up that, that, that this reminds me of a, a letter that Gandhi wrote to, um, I think, Churchill advising them to let the Nazis invade. And yes, that was a terrible mistake that Gandhi made. And that attitude, the attitude that I guess people are applying to your book, where they want 
uh, everything to be this field of flowers is not reflective of the way life is. Sometimes you have to fight. This is why sometimes the you, so absolutely. Sometimes, sometimes you have to fight. I believe, I believe that that's the case. Sometimes evil becomes so bad, so awful, so, so powerfully impinging on the sovereignty of others that the only way to stop it is to stand up and fight it. And I think that that's, you know, I, I think that's a conclusion many of us are coming to. And certainly violence isn't the only way to fight. Uh, but, you know, the, I think the battle involves taking the steps to find ayahuasca is its own fight, I would say. You know? Yes, it is. It yeah. is. It's, it's meant to be a, a, a journey. It's not meant to be easy. But uh, like any quest, uh, if you persevere, you will reach your goal. Mr. Hancock... Thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast. You're a brilliant human, and I think uh, you've become a shaman. How can people find you? Okay, so um, the, the easiest way, I guess, is my, uh, is my website, uh, which is uh, www.grahamhancock.com. And uh, I also have a YouTube channel, which is uh, youtube.com backslash user backslash grahamhancock.com i'm very appreciative of the time that you've given us thank you very much the following is from the holy sons album lost decade the name of the track is the voice and you can get it on itunes or bandcamp oh i don't have a friend in my head to say watch me get intoxicated Yeah. 